Um, my name is Tara Griffin. Uh, my company is Employer Essentials. Uh, we're an HR uh, outsourcing company and work with lots of different businesses uh, from one employee all the way through a couple hundred employees, helping them with all aspects of uh, HR. And we're talking about benefits today. So are you guys familiar with the website Glassdoor? Uh, it's a website where there's a lot of employee feedback uh, in regards to their employers, compensation, uh, benefits, perks, things like that. Anyway, they did a, a huge survey this in 2017, and 57% of employees count benefits and perks as top considerations before taking a new job. Now, benefits typically for smaller employers, they sound a little bit scary because they are and they can be quite expensive, and there's regulations and things that go around them, but there are a lot of uh, resources out there to help you as well. Um, why would we invest the time learning about benefit programs and providing them and, and the resources that go into that? It's, you know, as we just discussed or just went through that last slide, it has a lot to do with talent retention. And today's job market's pretty hard for employers. Um, there are a lot of jobs and there aren't as many employees to fill them. And so benefits is, is getting a lot more attention when they consider one position versus another. And there are lots of types of benefits and perks that can be given rather than just like a, a traditional health insurance plan. So we'll talk about some of those things. And as we go along, if you have a comment or a question, just raise your hand and, and we'll stop. So your culture, the morale, uh, compensation, and employee satisfaction are all reasons why we would dive into this. 57% um, again rank them as top considerations and 80% of employees want benefits or perks more than they want a pay raise. When you look at the cost of a pay raise versus additional benefits, it's actually less expensive typically to do benefits. Um, this is a, an employee from Reebok obviously a large, large employer. But I wanted to bring out the point here, um, or a point in regards to this. So Reebok encourages employees to reach their personal fitness goals provi by providing an on-site gym with CrossFit classes. What the employee said, the company mission and values are clear, communicated often, and embraced. It's okay to take an hour for fitness throughout the day and in fitness and fitness events are encouraged to participate in. And the point that I wanted to bring out and the reason why I included this slide was that when an employee was asked about benefits and perks, they included a comment about the company's mission and values and how they were um, congruent with what was being offered to the employees. And, and that's an important thing uh, to remember and also in talking to employees and educating them on what perks and benefits they get by working with you um, and having it tied to things like mission and values and making sure that their role and everything is clear, they start to equate those together and it, it does make an impact on job satisfaction for sure. Um, this is probably too tiny uh, for you to read, but it goes through and lists a whole bunch of benefits that could be given from gym memberships to on-site food to health and health insurance and paid time off and kind of employees in the survey ranked how much consideration, if they gave some consideration in considering taking a job to that particular benefit or heavy consideration. And we'll email these slides out so you can read that a little bit closer if you'd like. So according to benefits, the top and most important, or according to employees, the top benefits or most important benefits to them are health, dental, and vision, insur vision insurance, and flexibility, and time off, and work from home options. This is what consistently ranked at the top for employees. And then we're gonna go through, and these are the, um, I, don't, I can't remember how many um, different types. We're going to go through and talk about cost of benefits and just kind of touch on some of the types of benefits that different employers offer. Some of them are traditional. Some of them are not traditional. And there's also a link in, the pro, in this slideshow that will take you to a place on the Internet where it will tell, tell you how they came up with these costs 
or and these numbers to go with each of these benefits. So fully paid health care, average cost is a little under $12,000 a year. Um, obviously, the most expensive benefit, it's also ranked at the highest on the list um, by employees. Paid time off, two weeks costs about $2,300, three weeks, $3,400, and unlimited time off typically costs about $3,200. And I thought this was interesting because um, people who structure unlimited time off plans and flexible work schedules, they, there's structure to them. And when there's a, the appropriate structure to them and um, things are communicated clearly with employees and it's aligned really to accomplishing the goals and the results of the organization, it actually costs less than offering people um, three weeks worth of paid, paid time off during the year. And um, you don't have to carry that liability on your books either in that type of scenario. Quarterly fri Friday and Saturday corporate retreats. Um, real quick at the top, it says annual cost with a $60,000 base salary. So this is, these are costs based on somebody that would make about $60,000 a year as a full-time employee. Quarterly Friday and Saturday corporate retreats cost just over $2,000. $5,000 to take a month-long vacation every five years, about $2,000. Um, certainly, there's different variables that you could put in any of these types of things, but I thought it was interesting to see the cost that goes along with it. So if you considered like a pay raise versus, hey, every five years, I'm going to give you a certain amount of money to be able to go on a week-long vacation, the cost of that is significantly less, and that sounds like a really unusual benefit and something that could really help with retention and, and um, attracting some talent to your organization. A 3% match on a 401k, about $1,800. Free catered lunch daily, $1,700. 16 weeks paid paternity leave, $1,250. Free daycare services for one child, $1,200. So um, we'll talk about 401ks and profit sharing and stuff a little bit later in the slideshow. Um, but again, an $1,800 kind of average cost for a $60,000 a year paid employee, consider that versus what percent percentage of a raise you would need to give them for them to feel like it was anything significant. Um, whereas $1,800 because of a 401k match is going to be perceived as a much greater benefit than what that would equal in terms of a pay raise. Um, catered lunch daily, that sounds like a little bit much, but you know, once a month, maybe once a week, um, even just having snacks and things on site um, that are accessible to them rather than having like little money jars where everybody's got it on, their, on your honor, you know, put 50 cents in, but rather, rather than that, making them just available fairly inexpensive. Um, and daycare services, while that's not reasonable for most employers, I think, that are the size of employers at this conference, um, there are things like flexible spending accounts and things like that that you can offer to help offset those types of costs. Monthly team bonding events, about $1,000. Weekly employee outings, $1,000. $1,000 annual stipend to learn something new. $1,200 student loan assistance. Um, again, these are some ideas and some general costs. The things that could be changed. Um, you could give them a certain amount of money or an allowance every year for some continuing education stuff that also directly impacts how well they are trained for the position they're in at your company. But when you put a dollar amount to that, instead of just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we pay for training, when you put a dollar amount to that, and they get to have some choice as to what courses they might take, and they're allowed to go do that during the, during the day, then it starts to equate to dollars for them instead of just, oh, yeah, my company provides training. Free snacks, we talked about that, about $650. Free coffee. Fully covered dental insurance costs about $576 a year. An on-site gym. Again, probably not really reasonable for the size of employers here, but a gym membership. Um, not only does that encourage them to stay active and helps with overall employee performance and decreases sick days and things like that, but you put a dollar amount to it and it also um, equates to something that in their mind is compensation. 
$5,000 tuition reimbursement, dedicated game room, fully covered vision insurance. Um, I love ha keeping in my office, in the break room, we have a big TV, we have an Xbox, we've got that dancing game, we've got um, foosball, we don't have a ping pong table, but um, a foosball table in there, and I wish we had a ping pong table, but you know, people really don't take advantage of it. It, it works great, people will go in and have their lunch, they'll stop, they'll play for a little bit, sometimes at the end of the day, they'll stick around for a little bit longer and play a game or hang out with some of their coworkers. Um, but it, it's a fun little perk. So this is the reference um, that'll be part of the slideshow and you can just click on this link and go to that place on the internet to look at how those costs were, were derived. So um, let's talk about specific types of benefits a little bit closer. We're gonna start with paid leave because this is a, a big one at the top of the list with medical insurance and there is a cost to it, certainly, um, depending on the way that you structure it. It could be more or less expensive. Uh, vacation, sick time, and PTO. A lot of people kind of just all throw those into one category. They're not really sure what the difference is. And one of the main differences to look at there is really how your state defines them, your state department of labor, because there's different rules about how you offer them, what you carry over, what... Um, you have to pay out when somebody leaves your place of employment and so and also how they are accounted for on your books so i'll give you the state of colorado just as an example so that you know kind of what to go look for or think about in regards to your state but in the state of colorado um, the dol frowns on use it or lose it rules for vacation and sick time well not for sick time for vacation time excuse me so they have no problem if it's designated sick time that they do not get paid out sick days if they leave employment, and they don't need to carry them over from year to year. But if it's vacation time in the state of Colorado, they frown heavily on use it or lose it rules, and you do have to pay that out when, it, when somebody leaves employment. The workaround in Colorado is if you use the term PTO, paid time off, and you don't designate between sick or vacation time, and it's just a, a certain quantity, and you make it available for them to use throughout the year, then you don't have to pay it out when they leave, and you don't have to roll things, roll hours over from year to year. So it's like a gifted thing instead of an accrued thing. Anytime that you get into an accrued vacation or even a PTO time where it's accrued, then that changes what you have to do accounting-wise, and it also changes the way that the Department of Labor will look at what you do at that time when somebody leaves employment. Uh, maternity, paternity, maternity and paternity leave, um, that is um, a company's choice. It is something that I am in favor of. I think it makes a big difference in um, people wanting to come back to work and, and just the overall morale how much you know, it, it would be dependent upon the resources of the company and what they can handle. And I put FMLA in there just in quotes because if you have over 50 employees, then you are gonna have to give, you are required to give time off, but it does not require to be paid time off. So I just wanted to make sure that note was included in there. Bereavement, um, a lot of companies will give one or two days off for if there's a loss in somebody's immediate family. Also a great benefit where employees tend to feel that they are better taken care of. So you didn't ask them to use a vacation day, which they would have happily done, but they keep their vacation days, they've lost somebody important to them, and they have a couple of paid days off. It makes a huge impact in how they feel um, in regards to the company itself and, and being cared for. More time off around holidays. Um, a lot of people have you know, their standard six holidays, and then I really like to include flex holidays in there. So that people, if whatever holiday, whether it's a religious holiday or anything else like that, that they wanna observe, they have a couple of holidays that they can just choose um, to take whenever they, they want to. Um, and a paid off day on your birthday. I think that Whisper does this. Uh, who said that? I think, I, like I heard this last year, I think, um, that Whisper does that. I thought that was a great idea. Paid off for your birthday, take the day off. I thought that was awesome. 
Um, at our company, we decorate your door or your cubicle, but I think this is better. Medical insurance. So there are different ways to provide medical insurance to your employees. Um, there's group health. And there's different types of group health plans, fully insured, level funded, and self-funded. And there are different strategies and things that you can use um, really to contain cost by using some non-traditional methods like level funded or self-funded plans. It, also, it depends on the size of your group. I would not typically look at anything level funded or self funded unless you have over 20 people enrolled in a medical insurance plan. It's just, it's not sustainable. You don't see the benefits and stuff. You're better off in a fully insured plan. Uh, is there anyone that wants to ask questions or wants to know more specifics about level funding or self funded medical plans and how those work? Okay. There's another option that not a lot of people know about, and at this time, it only works if you have 50 employees or less. But employees can go get their own individual insurance, and as an employer, you can sponsor a premium-only HRA, which stands for Health Reimbursement Arrangement. And you do have to have a document in place to be compliant with the IRS. And then if you have that in place, and employees, you want to offer, let's say, just a flat amount of $200 a month to go towards somebody's um, insurance premium. The employee can go get their own insurance, whatever insurance they want to get as their own private individual plan. And they can submit proof that they've paid that to you, and you can reimburse them the $200. Now, if it costs $150, you only reimburse $150 for you know, just to demonstrate how that works. But there is um, that option as well, where you can still provide that benefit without taking on the whole exposure of ACA rules and regulations and, and being a, a plan administrator. And then the other option is don't offer them. Any questions about that? Cafeteria plans are great uh, to coincide with the insurance, uh, flexible spending accounts, um, allow people to take money pre-tax out of their paycheck, put it aside in an account, and be able to submit things like prescriptions or for eyeglasses and, and things like that. So it just allows them to pay coinsurance, deductibles, um, prescriptions and stuff with pre-tax money and, you know, could save them a good 30% on those, on those dollars. And then, um, well, HSA is spelled incorrectly here. My spell check helped me out, I see. Um, but an HSA is a health spending arrangement, and it's similar to a flexible spending account in that there's pre-tax dollars that go in there, but it is only available if the type of medical plan that the employee is enrolled in is a high deductible medical plan. So it has to be designated as HSA compatible or eligible. Those, plan, or those fun, um, accounts, HSA accounts, are awesome. They are pre-tax, so it saves the employee some money as they put money aside and they can change how much they want to put in there from paycheck to paycheck if you let them. You can set rules for how to administer that with your employees, but you can let them change that on an ongoing basis. And so if they had a surgery come up and they needed $2,000 to go towards their deductible, they could have that taken out over the next couple of paychecks and be paying with pre-tax money. The other great thing is that the this saving vehicle goes with the employee wherever they're at. If you sponsor a high deductible medical plan through your company, you can also send the employee off to go set up their own HSA account with pretty much any bank. You don't have to set it up and, and monitor it for them. Um, HRA, health reimbursement arrangement, we talked about the premium only HRA. There are other types of HRAs where the, it is only employer funded and it's an account where if you choose, you can put money aside to go towards specific benefits for your employees. So for example, let's say you have a high deductible plan or it's kind of an expensive out of pocket plan for employees. You can set up an HRA that says, I'm gonna pay, or the HRA is going to pay the first $500 of the deductible or coinsurance for every employee. So people will use those to choose less expensive premium plans with higher out-of-pocket costs to the employees and then offset that out-of-pocket cost to the employees by providing an HRA 
and and then you only fund the HRA when a claim is made by the employee. And so if if nobody uses it, then it doesn't cost the the company anything. Any questions about that? And then dependent care. Um, in an earlier slide, I, I briefly mentioned it, but again, an opportunity for employees to put away money pre-tax so that they can pay for daycare and, and child care expenses. <clears throat> so dental insurance, vision insurance, and then supplemental insurance. Um, there are lots of different types of supplemental insurance, and these are great plans, especially if you don't have a medical plan at your company. So let's say, for example, that somebody who works for you goes to the bar over the weekend, they get a little beat up, something happens, they show up on wor to work on Monday, they didn't have any health insurance benefits, and now they're going to have a hard time either working or something happens, and they instead turn in a workers' comp claim that says I fell down the ladder because they don't really feel like they have any other options, okay? So if there's supplemental insurance in place, even if you don't provide medical insurance, there could be things like accident policies and short-term disability and long-term disability and stuff that will help supplement the income for that person and help them in that type of a situation. So, and they, they've done studies on this. It actually shows that they are less likely to make a fraudulent workers' comp claim if there's medical insurance in place, but even if there's not, they're still less likely if you have some of the supplemental type policies in, in place. And you can, the employee can pay for them completely on their own. It's, it's really up to the company um, and the policy and the resources. Uh, profit sharing, 401ks, IRA, and there's Roth options in both. So Roth means that the money going into those accounts is post-tax. So people pay taxes, then they choose to put money into a Roth 401k or an IRA. And the benefit for that for um, lower income employees is that they're probably going to pay the least amount of tax at this point in their life while they're making a little bit less money. The purpose behind a 401k and IRA was to put tax deferred money into an account where it can grow and they don't have to, and people don't pay taxes. And at some other, some other time in life when they are retired and their income's gonna, they plan on their income being lower, they're gonna withdraw from those accounts and then it's gonna get taxed at that point. And so they've had a chance to grow their money, but they've also pulled it out at a time when they're not gonna pay as high of taxes. So a lot of companies will put 401ks and IRAs in place with the option to choose Roth or paying with post-tax dollars because they're already uh, at a low tax bracket and it doesn't do them any good to put it away pre-tax because they're probably going to be at least as high or higher later down the road in life. Um, so that's a great option to include in a 401k or an IRA and to make sure that you, you know, educate employees about that and what the purpose is. You can't tell them what to do, but you can certainly offer them the pros and cons. And if you're working with the right partner and, in, you know, advisor with those types of plans, then they should be willing to hold those meetings for you and, and really provide the documents and information for your employees. And profit sharing is, is something that, um, it's a very valued benefit for employees. So when they look at profit sharing as an option, that's something that really stands out in their mind in terms of a company that they would want to work for. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to structure profit sharing. You can do vesting schedules. You can um, you know, put different expectations and, and performance type things in there to, to govern how profit sharing and things are, are handled. Um, but that, that's something that's uh, really looked highly on by employees. So we, we've talked about some of these things earlier when uh, we were talking about the cost, but things like gym memberships, tuition reimbursements, food, snacks on site, a drink fridge, um, sponsored sporting events, you know, the company decides to sponsor a softball team and it provides for some recreation and adds to morale and team building and things like that. Offside events and time off for community service are, are some other ideas of things that, that 
would be beneficial to employees, and they don't cost nearly as much as the medical insurance option. So there are a lot of different, different ways to provide some perks that doesn't have to break the bank. And then the last point, again, is conversations with employees and educating them on what they're getting. You spend a lot of time trying to research benefit plans and decide what to offer. And then there are a lot of company resources that go into offering them, paying for them, um, time to register people and admin those types of plans. They're, they're expensive things. And a lot of employers just you know, put it in front of their employees and they don't think about it again until the next year when they're going to do an annual enrollment. But you're doing yourself really a disservice in terms of overall employee morale and attachment to your company by not making it something that's regularly talked about and educating them. And it doesn't have to be a big company-wide meeting every month, but making sure that you're sending the messages and, and checking in with employees and letting them help, making sure that they understand the value in terms of dollars for what they're getting. And um, there's total compensation reports. I don't know if, does anybody provide their employees with a total compensation report? Okay, so a total compensation report adds all of these things together. It, it's, it's your salary, bonuses, commissions, and um, the employer taxes that are paid. So employer FICA, Medicare, Social Security, those get added in a total compensation report. And then the cost of benefits, medical insurance, dental, vision, supplementary, any of those types of perks get added to that. And employees get presented with those usually during uh, annual performance reviews, and it shows them they're not actually just getting the $60,000. The number is much larger when you add all of those things together, and it really brings some awareness to them about what they're getting. So when they've got the guy down the road who's offering them 50 cents or a dollar more an hour, if these things are constantly being communicated to them or put in front of them or they get to see total compensation reports and information, they're a lot less likely to jump ship over something small because they don't know what they're getting over there. Um, I don't have any more slides, so questions? So the question was, is there a report or website or software that allows you to plug in that information to create a total compensation report? And there is, so if you use an outside payroll provider, a lot of them have total compensation reports in their software, and you can request them. If not, then you could just build a simple spreadsheet and use that, and I'm sure there's some other tools online. I haven't really searched for that. Our software has a total compensation report that we can spit out for all of our clients and all of their employees, and so I've just always relied on that and haven't really gone searching for anything else. But I know there's other payroll providers that have those reports included in their systems. Any other questions? So the question is, if you have contractors, what types of things can you offer them? Okay. So really the answer is you can't. So if they're a contractor, they're not an employee. And if you blur that line and you offer them perks and things that would kind of suggest that they're being treated like an employee, if you get audited and the Department of Labor comes in, or even if that contractor gets hurt or doesn't feel like something is fair, they're, they're being treated differently than the other employees, they could go make a complaint. And you could end up being in a situation where you get fined some pretty hefty dollars for having misclassified employees. So if you have somebody that's a contractor or paid on a 1099 and the Department of Labor comes in and says, no, that was a misclassification, they really are a W-2 employee, they're gonna fine you. And on top of it, you're gonna have to go and pay all the taxes back to the state and to the federal government that they believe you should have paid based on how much you paid the contractor, um, and it, it's not pretty. So just to clarify. So I personally wouldn't worry about that one. Uh, you know, if they wanna come in and, and you let your contractors come in and use a sim general space, whether it's, you know, the meeting space or it's the break room and stuff, I wouldn't worry about that. I wouldn't tell them to stay out of your fridge. I think that that's fine. Um, if you're paying for on-site babysitting, I would say that's different, that they would have to pay for the babysitting. So you could allow them to use the facility, but the way that they use it would be different than the way employees would use it. 
So he's asking about the difference between level funded and self funded. So certainly there's a lot of places we would go with that, but I'll give you the, the brief explanation. So a fully insured medical plan means that you give all of your premium dollars to let's call it Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. They take 100% of the liability and they say, great, we're gonna adjudicate claims, we're gonna pay for claims, we're gonna pay for prescriptions, we're gonna provide all of this information to employees. It's our problem, not yours. Thanks for your dollars, okay? In a level funded arrangement, it's really a self-funded arrangement. So you have fully insured and then you have self-funding in medical insurance. One way to self-fund is called level funding. And what that means is that you still fund to the maximum liability of that plan. When you build a self-funded plan, you take all the different pieces that Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield's already pulled together, and you can choose them. So you can create a strategy for cost containment within your company by pulling together different networks of doctors or different types of prescription plans and providers. Um, and then you, you buy different types of insurance called reinsurance that, um, to protect the assets of that plan. So what happens in self-funding is, is your insurance broker and TPA come back and say, this is how much it's gonna cost for us to adjudicate and pay claims. This is how much it costs for the doctor networks. This is what it costs for the reinsurance to protect the plan. And this is what we think claims are, gonna, are going to cost. And so they give you like a, an attachment point or a price that looks very much like a premium for employee only, employee plus child, family, et cetera. It looks like a premium rate. And now you take that premium rate and you pay it to yourself in a bank account that your TPA or your third party administrator is gonna handle the claims is going to pay the claims out of. And they're gonna pay for the reinsurance and they're gonna pay for the network fees and all of those types of things. So now you're taking that money and you put it in your own account instead of Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now if claims come in that are less than what you've put in there, that difference is yours to keep. If claims are more than what you put in there, that's where the reinsurance comes into play and it's there to protect against single uh, losses that are large, like somebody had a $100,000 surgery, you, you, there's insurance that caps that, typically somewhere between, between $25,000 and up. And the, uh, they also protects against the whole pot. So if it, all of the claims are more than what you've put aside, then there's insurance that protects that and then they pay the claims that go beyond that. So. What level funding means is that you fund that account to your maximum liability so that you know your plan will not cost you anything more than that because the reinsurance carrier will pay anything beyond that. In self-funded plans, you don't have to fund that to maximum liability. You can fund it to what you expect the liability to be and know that you're taking on the risk that if it goes beyond that, and there's a gap between what you fund and what the reinsurance carrier is going to cover. You know you have a financial responsibility there, but you don't always have to put it in from the beginning to that amount. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's all I've got for you today. If you have more questions and you want to come talk to me individually, feel free. We're definitely uh, finishing up a little bit early. Maybe there's another session you want to go peek in on as well, but I'll be up here if you have questions. Thank you.